So I want to open my talk this afternoon with a poem by Naomi Shihab Nye. Paul Robeson stood on the northern border of the USA and sang into Canada, where a vast audience sat on folding chairs waiting to hear him. He sang into Canada. His voice left the USA when his body was not allowed to cross that line. Remind us again, brave friend, what countries may we sing into? What lines should we all be crossing? What songs travel toward us from far away to deepen our days? So as I said, this poem was written by Naomi Shihab Nye, a Palestinian American poet and professor of poetry, about a specific moment in the early 1950s when Paul Robeson, a famous African American entertainer, had his passport revoked or blocked by the American government for his political activities. This meant that Robeson could no longer travel outside the United States to fulfill his performance contracts in other countries. But he still had many fans in Canada, so he drove to the Peace Bridge on the American side of the US-Canada border and performed a concert there. She had Nye's poem is deceptive in its simplicity. What is the border she's describing here? Is it a line drawn on the ground? Is it the Peace Bridge? Is it a patrol station? She shows us a singer whose body might be stuck in one country, but whose voice, whose message, spirit, and really soulfulness can cross over a border and reach people on the other side. Shihab Nye asks us all to consider how we can build community with the stories and songs that we share and the stories and songs that might travel toward us from far away the stories and songs that we receive from others. In fact, she urges us to realize that we must cross lines and borders. I chose to open with this poem today because it speaks of the power and potential of community-engaged arts. Before I dig in, I want to thank, where did Linda Thomas go? Linda Thomas, Christina Moss, Daniel Salih, and the other people who built and sustained the scaffolding of the Border Crossings Project over the past three years and through this particular program that I got to be part of, and to the wonderful team at the Art Gallery of Mississauga whose work supported our learning community in the Legacy Project. And of course, a special thank you to the Ontario Trillium Foundation, the Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Mississauga for their generous funding of these initiatives. So as you heard earlier, I was brought in to facilitate the Legacy Engagement Project, a course in the third year of the Border Crossings Initiative, to engage the partner organizations of the Art Gallery of Mississauga in some experiential, as I like to say, hands-on and hearts-in learning about how community-based arts engagement can open up new modes of sharing and community conversations. So we had 23 participants and as I mentioned earlier, they represented 14 diverse community groups in the region of Peel and the city of Mississauga. And they spent this intense five week period meeting with us twice a week uh, through the end of May and most of June, just this past spring. And we were blessed with a bounty of outstanding guest artist facilitators with Amy and I'm just looking around seeing a whole bunch of our facilitators are here today. Um, I saw Tanisha was somewhere before too and Anto, amazing. So um, we just had such a, such a rich bounty of opportunities to learn across different media and it was a really big growth experience for me as well even though I was co-facilitating it. I just um, loved watching everybody. So at the core of our learning, we were asking not just a question about border crossings, but a question about how can we bring forward the inner voices of our community members through the arts to build deeper and stronger, deeper relationships and stronger, healthier communities. We centered our conversations and our explorations in our, on the theme of border crossings and on the creative and generative power of artistic fusion in our own art making borderlands. We mixed different media like poetry and painting together or painting and collage. 
and we made collaborative poems that became songs. So we really played with all kinds of different materials and different forms. We asked everyone to come with an attitude of beginner's mind. This is a Zen Buddhist idea that asks us all to sort of flutter over a new canvas or page, hover over it a little bit, start a new activity with an attitude of openness and eagerness without preconceptions of what it might be or should become, putting aside the idea of uh, expectations and product, and really giving ourselves over to process. And to our enormous delight, we all dove into the unknown together with this beginner's mind, giving ourselves over to the process of exploring new materials or old materials through new prompts and putting aside those expectations of final product. And this to me is one of the hearts of community engaged arts. Community engaged arts breaks down the old borders between community members and professional trained artists and in the space of this middle ground, in the borderland, if you will, where trained artists and untrained community members meet, where different mediums might come together, amazing new things happen that can enliven and enrich our communities, deepening the personal and social growth of both the individual and community. In community-engaged arts, the arts are open to people of all ages, cultures, abilities, and arts experience. The core idea is to build a foundation of participatory, inclusive, interactive, and respectful ways for lots of different people to meet, work together, and express themselves through arts projects. So here I'm defining the arts broadly to include all kinds of visual media like painting and drawing, collage, um, tactile things that, well, painting can be very tactile as Tanisha showed us too, verbal modes of sharing narrative, like storytelling, spoken word, and poetry, and performative media, like music, or even just sound making that isn't necessarily yet music, maybe it is, um, improvisation, and movement exercises. So we really explored all kinds of things like this, and in all of these media, we explored new materials and how playing with those new materials and media can lead to the generation of new ideas and insights. The practice of community-engaged arts is a growing field and has been supported by the agencies that give out grant money at every level of government. The Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Council for the Arts, the Toronto Council for the Arts, um, as well as by private companies and donors because it is a proven way of creating understanding, building bridges, and developing the rich cultural life of our communities. Community-engaged arts projects happen all over the community in public spaces like community centers, parks, pools, city streets, or back alleys, as well as in the more traditional art spaces like galleries and theaters. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about some of the core principles of community-engaged arts and trying to connect for you, um, you know, as sort of a framework for the panel that's gonna follow this so that we can see what the foundations were that we learned and then in the panel we'll get to hear a little bit of some of those on the, on the ground learning. So, among the core principles of community-engaged arts, I just want to start with, oh, good, there, uh, mutual respect and relationship-centered work. So, mutual respect between artists and community members is key to the success of these projects. Mutual respect among all the participants is another key. The centrality of relationship building is really the heart of community-engaged arts. We're not making art in isolation, like some kind of lone genius off in a studio somewhere, but within the context of community, and for community, and about community. And one of the experts in the field of community-engaged arts, someone named Lori Magali, puts it really well. Collaboration is not the goal in itself, neither is the creation of a product. The goal is to collaborate to create art together. The art is shaped by the relationship, and the relationship is shaped by the art. So the artistic outcome is a representation, if you will, of relationship. And that, to me, is really the crux of all of it. But on top of that, we'll layer on cooperation, collaboration, co-creation, and co-ownership. We talked about a number of different ways that you can build a scaffolding for community-engaged arts. And uh, most of what we did in our legacy engagement project was 
sort of um, just empowering people who don't see themselves generally as artists to experiment with different parts of the creative process. But there are so many different shapes that community engaged arts projects can take. And they might be conceiving of and executing a project together with others or gathering community stories and input. Um, it might be engaging your toddler to teach you how to dance. It might be uh, something like this. This is Maggie Hutchison of Toronto, um, of the Department of Public Memory. This is a community engaged arts project that Maggie and her partner put together where they collected stories and insights from vanishing projects in the Toronto area. And then they created, they did printmaking signs where they created um, tributes to things, to programs and services that were being defunded and decommissioned by the city. And so they put those projects, those signs up around the community to reflect the changing landscape of the city and the less well met needs of the people in certain areas. So that was a really important effort to engage the community as a storytelling process, um, more so than as a finished art making product. The product seems to have come mostly from Maggie and Eleanor. You might set up community engaged arts projects in unusual spaces, like this laundromat project in New York City, where people set up a community art station at the laundromat because that's where people go, that's where people meet, right? And so that is a great opportunity for people to put some art making into practice and to hear from the community and get them to find different modes of self-expression in a space that they're already in anyway. And this one is, um, I don't know how many of you know Candy Chang's work, but Candy Chang is an international, I don't even know where Candy Chang is based actually. Candy Chang works internationally on projects all over the world and does amazing um, interventions, if you will, in different community spaces. So here, this is in Finland, this is a, a career path where she did sidewalk chalk um, invitations to people to write down what they wanted to be when they were little and what they want to be now that they are quote grown up or in the process of growing up. And so people can come and use this, this scaffolding that she's created and participate and add their own voices to the mix. So back to some of the core principles of community engagement, I'll add to the list radical inclusion. Think about the communities that we serve and the diversity that we engage with across racial, gender, LGBTQ+, socioeconomic lines, all of those different borders that we construct artificially and that we need to cross over, as Naomi Shihab and I would say. Imagine bringing together everyone from those infants and toddlers who taught us to dance, to elders who might teach us different movements, right? Professionals and people with no training or special skills in the arts. And that really, again, is the heart of what we're trying to do here. To this, we'll add appreciation of difference. The idea of community engaged arts is that we're not trying to make everyone fit into a neat little package. We're celebrating the unique voices that we each bring to the conversation. And we're not teaching technique as much as we're opening up prompts. So when we teach technique, a lot of the time, we give people an assignment of working on, working toward a specific goal, right? I taught pottery, so if you wanna make a pot on the wheel, we're teaching you a particular technique so that you can reproduce this structure and try to do it as accurately as possible. But in community engaged arts, there's often a lot more leniency, a lot more flexibility. We give you the opening prompt and we give you some foundational technique ideas, but we often give you an opportunity to play and explore and see what comes. And there's, again, no emphasis on the decided outcome in some of the work that we're doing here. And that gives people a room for their own unique lenses and their experiences to come forward in a really compelling way. Generosity of spirit, I want to add to the list. And this is really important because the language that we use to frame our invitation to creative process and to the community and to community engagement is so important. So part of it is in how we promote this work and how we invite people into it. Um, and then the part of it is also in the way that we hold space for others. And that's, again, really key to the process. We want to establish an invitation to newness, to playfulness, to experimentation. 
and to frame the opportunity for trial and error in a supportive and understanding way. And then we'll add building mind-body connection. Because in addition to building relationships beyond ourselves, we're also building a better relationship to ourselves as we engage in creative process. We can foster imagination, a sense of belonging, a deeper understanding of the self as we go through these processes. We relearn how to tap into our intuition, that inner voice that's so often silenced by other forces in our lives. And then we discover the potential of the arts to improve our mood and our focus, to build empathy and resilience, to bring clarity about emotions, goals, and challenges. And to this again, I would add more, that this is really a, an emergent process. It's very process-based work. We're letting the work emerge through the process over time. And we're really cultivating this environment of exploration, experimentation, and adventure. So as I said maybe a minute ago, um, before the pandemic, I was teaching pottery in a couple of great studios in Toronto. And when I taught beginners, I would often just give them a ball of clay. I think I said this to some of you before in one of the videos, that I would just give people a ball of clay and I would invite them to stick their thumb into it and just start to squeeze it, right? You're making a pinch pot and see what happens. And something starts to develop in the dialogue that because there's an intuitive uh, movement that you're, that you're creating a dialogue between you and the clay, or between you and whatever materials you're exploring, and in that dialogue, new ideas emerge, and maybe new opportunities start to kind of crystallize into a path forward, right? So you, you start to develop a plan as you go, even if you didn't set out with a plan at the beginning. So this is really a, a great kind of prompt as an example because when you stick your thumb into a ball of clay in the center, you're probably going to make a fairly round centered bowl, but if you stick your thumb into the side of a ball of clay, then you're going to make an off-center kind of bowl. And lots of different things can happen, right? How do you learn to control the shape of it then? Um, when the pandemic started, I will confess that I um, was very isolated and I started collecting eggshells and pistachio shells from all my cooking and the more they gathered around me and they gathered a lot around me many many of these things this is just a small sampling of what I actually have in my house right now but um, I thought oh free art materials I'm broke I don't have a job right now so this is great right um, and uh, and then it started to evolve into different ideas because the more I sat with these things and stared at them and played with them and thought, what can I do with them? And make sure you clean your eggshells really well, right? <laughs> That's another important detail. Um, but I started to experience a lot of creative potential just having them around and playing with them. So you never know what sources you'll find for your creativity just as you start to explore the stuff in your life. Like before you throw out your old earphones, imagine making them into part of a sculpture or something, right? Things that, things that are broken don't, and, and become so-called obsolete can be repurposed for art. So uh, I think as Cindy Schuelos and Marie Lopez, who are two experts in the field of recreation studies say, engagement, improvisation, risk, dialogue, reflection, disruption, revelation, compromise, and cooperation are the art in this work. That's what we're doing. That's the potential of community-engaged arts. To help regular folks in our communities, people who don't identify as artists with a capital A, express ideas they haven't expressed before, or kind of tap into a flow state and a sense of calm in the creative process and find that emotional regulation. And that spirit of exploration and experimentation then bleeds over into our relationships and will breed more open and honest dialogue among all of us. And if you're sitting there and you're still hesitant to experiment with creative process, or if you think about all those voices in your life who said to you over the years that you were not an artist with a capital A, or that you weren't very good at this, and you learned to play to other strengths in your life, to you I will say, there's no such thing as failure in this process. There's no such thing as not getting it right or wasting materials. You know, but if you're still having trouble shaking those voices, just remember what comics guru and genius Linda Berry has to say about this. In her book, Syllabus, which is a life-changing book for me, um, she says, how old do you have to be to make a bad drawing? What is that cuss, right? 
So in a few minutes, I get to talk in person with some of the participants from the Legacy Engagement Project, and we'll get to hear a bit more about the details and the impact of the program from their experiences of it, to hear about the work that they're implementing in their own organizations. Um, but I just wanted to say that looking at the feedback that you all submitted um, after the course, it is clear that it was a really powerful force for everybody who participated in the program that everybody reported becoming, or most people reported becoming more confident in using art and stories to express themselves, more confident in using art to engage their communities, becoming more knowledgeable and skilled in various art forms, and building community relationships through the program, which is really what we were trying to do. So I wanna close out by sharing with you a project that our cohort created together. And I don't think that you folks have seen this because I just put this together with video, with the, not video, but with images um, a couple of days ago. And we borrowed um, a set of prompts called I Am From, from a, an educator who does a lot of EDI work, um, education, diversity, and inclusion work. I think, I think she's based in New York, Yavila McCoy. And uh, the prompts are things like I Am From, and then you're to list the smells and sounds and um, sites of the neighborhood that you grew up in, or I am from, and list all the family sayings that, you know, favorite foods that remind you of home, traditions, place names, landscapes, things that formed part of your existence, part of where what's in your blood, right? And um, it's a list-making exercise that McCoy employs in community settings to generate open dialogue, and we employed it here as the basis of a collaborative, multivocal poem. And by multivocal, I mean that it was authored anonymously by all 24 of us. And it included also um, prompts like, I hope, or I wonder, or I dream. So everyone contributed, everybody did this work at home, made their lists, and then they all contributed, as you can see here, to a Google Jam board. And everybody anonymously submitted their pieces, and there were three pages of this Jam board. And then I went home and I took all of these, well, I was home, Actually, and I took all of these details and um, I, I reorganized them into something that I thought had some kind of order, um, some kind of rhythm or sound, some kind of poetic um, potential. And out of that poem, um, one of our participants, Z Thomas, one of the members of our cohort, made this incredible recording set to a backing track. And then I just threw up some basic slide animation so you could follow along. And for me, this is a perfect note to close out on because it is a magical illustration of the heart and soul of this cohort and of community-engaged arts. That the art is shaped by the relationship and the relationship is shaped by the art and they are the same thing. And this poem holds inside of it all of our relationships across our little Zoom box borders and shows us some of the lines that we all crossed and it became a song that travels toward us from far away to deepen our days.